And as a former legislator myself, I know there's a lot of negotiating going on behind the scenes between the House and the Senate. Whether it's the budget or major policy bills, there's still many consequential decisions to be made over the next couple of weeks. I'm sure you're well aware of my concerns with the budget, as well as raising taxes and fees, which also means I have significant concerns with the legislature's version of paid family leave and child care bills, which rely on taxing already overburdened Vermonters while we have historic surpluses. But as you've heard me say over the past several months, the good news is we share priorities. We both put forward plans on child care and paid leave. In fact, my plans land somewhere between where the House and Senate differ and could be part of the compromise they seek, because I firmly believe we can take meaningful steps in all these areas without raising taxes and fees, which is what I campaigned on in the last election, and it appears Vermonters agree with that approach. This is especially true with paid family leave. Again, as a reminder, my plan is voluntary, and we've already set up the mechanism, which Commissioner Gaffney will talk about in a few minutes. As well, uh, state employees will be eligible on July 1, which we, the state, are paying for, and Hartford Insurance will be offering it to private employers within the year. This is a much faster turnaround than the House proposal, which will take years to set up and capitalize. My approach also won't require adding expensive IT, and future legislators uh, and legislatures won't have to deal with the ongoing expense of 65 additional state employees to oversee it, and it can be scaled and customized. For childcare, the $56 million I had in my budget would cover 4,000 more kids, which would be a huge step forward without raising taxes on working Vermonters. Again, the good news is our priorities are aligned, and as the legislature makes decisions in their conference committees, I hope they consider the paths we put forward. I'm going to now turn it over to Secretary Samuelson for more on our child care plan. Good morning. Vermonters have a need and deserve high quality child care. Vermont's children depend on their child care settings for early learning, enrichment, and a safe and high quality environment. Vermont parents and caregivers count on their child care, after school, and summer settings for safe, supervised, enriching environments to enable them to participate in the workforce, which is critical for Vermont's economy at this point. Vermonters need a system that enables both children and their families to thrive. The child care system has been struggling for the, set, for the past several years, with tuitions creating a significant financial stress for families year over year, and while, and while also not addressing the wage and quality issues for child care providers. The pandemic has had a significant impact on this fragile system, exacerbating both the needs and the cost. The governor's package of initiatives responds to the system's needs in childcare, after school programs and summer care programs with attention to accessibility and affordability for families to be supported in the workforce. We owe it to Vermonters and our children to do this in a responsible way though. It doesn't make sense to increase the tax burden on the very Vermonters who need this program the most. The governor's plan is, six, is $56 million, a key investment in Vermont child care programs. Vermont can afford the governor's plan and will increase affordability, access, and flexibility for families. We must do this in a responsible way. We are taking individuals with the most, we are taking into account the individuals who need these programs the most and making sure that they have access across the state. The governor's plan makes the following changes. It establishes equity in the child care financial assistance program known as CCFAP 
by ensuring that the state is paying the same rates on behalf of families regardless of whether their programs are um, involved in the STARS program or not. It serves more Vermont school children through the Making Room for Me grants and the Summer Matters Works program. It expands CCFAP eligibility from 350% of FPL to 400% of FPL. A family of three with an annual income of $92,000 would qualify to help for paying for childcare. Let's set up a child, let's set up Vermont children and families for success. And that starts living within our means while providing programs that people in Vermont depend on. Over 90% of brain development occurs in the early childhood years, and after school programs are safe, loving, and stimulating environments when child care providers have safe and afford when, when families have safe and affordable care for their children, they're able to participate in our workforce and contribute to Vermont's economy. So it's vital that we move forward at this time. Thank you. And I'll pass it over to Commissioner Gaffney. Thank you. Good afternoon. As part of the implementation team, uh, as the governor alluded, the uh, phase one uh, paid family medical leave insurance program will commence effective July 1. Uh, this will be for the state employees. Uh, we're in the midst of that process. As my, with my regulator hat on, we're reviewing the contract coverage forms and we just approved those yesterday and expect the rates to be filed by the Hartford uh, as early as next Monday. Uh, we'll have those reviewed in time for that 7-1 effective date. At the same time, there's been a number of activities between the Hartford and the state on planning our post-implementation post activities after phase one. As you may recall, phase two will take effect July 1, 2024 and will be available to employers of group sizes of two or more. Post implement implementation of phase one, we will start a, a promotion and education effort with the Hartford uh, to get the word out to employers so that when uh, July of 24 comes around, there's full awareness that they start talking to their insurance brokers about options and choice. This program gives uh, employers that choice. The, the phase one plan is a foundation which employers can choose to build off of. Um, the work uh, of the, uh, the Hartford in this promotion and um, education phase is just one example of the value of working with an institution that has experience in delivering and administering paid family leave insurance programs. And we feel that this is the most efficient way to deliver this program. Thank you. I'll pass it back to the governor. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, at this point, we'll open up to questions. Um, over the past many weeks and months that we've been coming here to talk to you, um, it seems like there's been, you put a red line down in terms of uh, new taxes, new fees, that you're just not going to be able to support legislation that includes either of those things. Um, when you were on Vermont edition uh, earlier this week, uh, you were asked if that meant you were going to be vetoing the child care bill, the budget, and you said, you know, I've got to see everything in the aggregate, um, how it all comes together. Is there a path for trilateral negotiations over the next week and a half um, that ends with a package of things that does include tax or fee increases that you can uh, maybe grudgingly allow to become law? Um, well, there's always room for negotiation. Uh, thus far, uh, they haven't asked for our input. Uh, we've been providing it. Uh, we provided the uh, uh, the Dear Jane, Dear Diane letter uh, for their conference committee in terms of the budget. And uh, we hope that uh, they will consider uh, some of our approaches that we had proposed in the initial budget. Uh, some of the complexities, uh, and I, uh, you know, I understand the process, but uh, they overspent the budget adjustment by 50 million. So they've spent some of the money that we had proposed uh, to utilize uh, for some of these programs. So. It will be difficult, um, but, uh, but at the, the same time, uh, at a time when Vermont has historic, historic surpluses, we're going to have 200 million probably uh, at the end of this fiscal year in surplus. Um, it's hard to, to uh, 
communicate to Vermonters as to why we're raising their taxes and fees. They ju it just doesn't make sense to them. And it doesn't make sense to me either. Uh, so I think there's another path forward, um, but we'll see how the negotiations, if there are negotiations, how well they go. And uh, I'm always willing to listen. Uh, and uh, as I've shown over, over the years, um, I believe that there is room for compromise, but it depends on what they put on the table. Governor, as you saw, the uh, Franklin County State's Attorney uh, is facing calls to step down, has not, and uh, they're now calling on uh, House leadership to begin uh, exploring impeachment. Uh, any initial thoughts on uh, what we heard yesterday and also how this process maybe could play out? Yeah, well, it's a legislative process, obviously, uh, first of all, and um, they would have to, to agree to move forward. Uh, impeachment's a very high bar uh, when you think about, you know, what would prompt uh, an impeachment. Um, usually criminal charges of some sort would prompt a, um, an impeachment, but uh, in this case, I, I haven't seen that there are criminal charges, at least not yet, and uh, there certainly appears to be some improprieties uh, in terms of uh, conduct on the job, uh, but, uh, but again, I don't know all the details at this point in time. Uh, we weren't part of that. We were given a, a heads up that this was coming yesterday morning. And um, we'll just see how it plays out. But it really is in the hands of the legislature at this point, uh, whether they move forward. And uh, again, um, I think there were a lot of calls. I called on the, uh, the sheriff uh, to step down, uh, and there were criminal charges uh, against the sheriff. So um, they haven't moved forward on an impeachment there. So I, I just, I'm not sure what they're going to do, but probably the speaker could answer that. And at the same time, there's this evolving conversation about uh, you know, the sheriff bill, looking for oversight, uh, maybe a constitutional amendment next session. Have you had any, uh, have you gotten to take a look at either one of those initiatives and have had any conversation with uh, the governor's yeah, office? I mean, I've been uh, speaking with a number of legislators and sheriffs and, and other uh, interested parties on the, on the sheriff's bill, the so-called sheriff's bill. It seems to be mixed as to whether some uh, think it's the right approach. Uh, some think that it's not need needed, not necessary. And uh, so we'll see where it all comes out, sugars off in the end. There's a scenario in which um, the House initiates impe impeachment proceedings, but needs to hold a special session in order to hold a vote on a resolution. Um, what would, what's the deliberate process you would work through to determine whether or not to call that special session? Yeah. Well, the, the legislative leadership uh, speaker, um, probably the pro tem as well, uh, would come and, and ask uh, for a special session from me. And, you know, I, if they think it's, uh, it's something that's uh, needed and necessary, I would probably grant that. Uh, Governor, Senator Rebecca White and other supporters say S5 doesn't force homeowners to go electric. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I've, I've responded to it a number of times, and I, we just fundamentally disagree. Uh, when you have a someone who is uh, living with modest means, and uh, they are faced with the, the option of uh, putting on a, a new heating system with heat pumps that will cost thousands of dollars, or pay more uh, for fuel, um, that doesn't seem like much of a choice to me. So I think there's another path forward. Uh, we can use more carrots and sticks, and this seems like the stick approach to me. Thank you. And, uh, Governor, you've spoken on this a little bit in the past, but uh, with H-230 coming to your desk, this is a suicide prevention gun bill, um, the 72 hour waiting period, safe storage. I know a lot of Vermonters are awaiting just what action you might take on that. I don't know if you have any. Yeah, first of all, I don't know as it's made it through the entire process. I, I don't know if they've um, uh, agreed, uh, the House has agreed with the Senate on this. They have, okay. Um, so it is heading uh, to my desk at some point, but it goes through their legislative process and, and their uh, alleged counsel before it comes to us. So I just wanna make clear that we may not receive that uh, instantaneously. Um, at that point in time, we have five days uh, to react. Um, I've said all along, I have some real issues with the constitutionality of the waiting period. 
Uh, the rest of the bill, uh, as it came out of the, the Senate and it appears that the, the House has agreed, um, I, could, I could live with. I think the red flag provisions uh, are something that, that I think are good, okay and good. Um, and, uh, and I also believe the safe storage uh, uh, area uh, that they uh, came to a conclusion on is also palatable and good. So um, I could live with those two portions, but the, the constitutionality bothers me. The Defender General uh, said the same thing, and there are many. I, I, don't, I don't doubt uh, that uh, if, if it goes into law, uh, that there will be a constitutional challenge. And it's too bad uh, that uh, the rest of the bill that appears to be helpful uh, would be held in hostage in some respects uh, while that happens. When you say constitutionality, I assume you want to do away with it uh, in total, not just say maybe do a 24-hour waiting period. Yeah, I think uh, there would be a constitutional challenge on anything uh, at that point. I mean, we're in a new era of the, uh, uh, the Supreme Court has, has ruled on this and, and has left it uh, open and, uh, and I think open to constitutional challenges. What would your reaction then be to Senator Phil Baruth? He said that he's talked with Attorney General Charity Clark and he feels confident that this would stand up if it was challenged, the constitutionality was. I guess they'll find out in court. There's no doubt that it'll be challenged. So we'll see what happens. But I think we're in a new era. And, uh, and again, I, the Defender General, I think there's a conflict of uh, opinions on this. And the Defender General said he thinks it'll be challenged as well. Can you tell us when you're planning to send your veto message to the legislature on this one? Tomorrow. Okay. Yes. Back to two very um, easy to get in the court. Do you think that the good use of state time and resources to defend this bill from court? Well, they will. I, I know. I think the Attorney General has already pledged to, to defend it. But do you think that's a good use of state resources? Well, I think the Attorney General has to defend the state. Um, again, uh, I, it, it, I've had been critical of the Attorney General in the past. It seems as though they pick and choose who they would, uh, would support and defend and who they wouldn't. Uh, I had, uh, I had a, a bill that I uh, vetoed and, and I felt was unconstitutional and they refused to, uh, to support that. But again, um, this is, uh, this is what they want to do, and they have that prerogative. Um, S-100 has made its way out of the uh, Environment and Energy Committee in the House. Um, your thoughts on what they settled on? I don't know what they've settled on. I know that there was a poison pill that was uh, identified uh, yesterday, and I believe in real time this morning they uh, settled on that, so I think it's okay. Uh, I would uh, I would like for us to go further on Act 250, as you well know, uh, but I think that uh, where they are right now seems like it's uh, reasonable and and would be helpful. Um, there are a number of residents of motel rooms that have begun sharing their stories with members of the media um, as part of an effort to convince elected officials like you to rethink their position on what that program should look like going forward. Um, I'm wondering if you've listened to, read, watched any of their stories, um, and if you have, how that's changed or not um, yeah. the way you view this. You know, again, as I've said, uh, I know how difficult this is. I know what a heavy lift there will, this will be, uh, but the program's ending. The pandemic has ended. This, this federal money is, is it's not coming in anymore. The $20 million a month we're spending, uh, 18 to 20 million we're spending, uh, is just not sustainable uh, for us. Now, uh, we keep extending uh, the date in which we're going to end the program, and I think most uh, legislators, and, and certainly I agree, that it's got to end sometime. Uh, and when is a good time to have this end? We could take uh, money, let's say, uh, from VHCB, uh, that would be $50 million uh, that we're going to put into permanent housing and so forth and extend this program for another two and a half months in the middle of September. But then we're going to end up in the same place. So it's not as though we have just been sitting on our hands here. Uh, and I'll let the secretary um, talk about this a little bit more. 
Um, but we've gone in uh, to try and identify what the needs are of those who are still involved in the program, how we can help them. The general assistance program isn't ending. Uh, this portion is ending and we need to move on. So again, I, uh, I don't underestimate uh, how dif difficult this is for some of those uh, folks involved, uh, but, um, but it's time. We, we have to end it sometime. We can't keep going uh, with a $20 million a month program. Secretary Samuelson. To echo what the governor said, this program isn't sustainable, and it's taking away from our opportunity to really to really address the the challenge that we have in front of us, which is the affordable units that we need in the state of Vermont. We have spent since October and even before that going into the hotels, uh, working with individuals to create plans to be able to move forward. We recognize it's a relatively diverse population um, that are living in the hotel in the hotels and trying to wrap around supports around them to help them move forward. What we also know from going into the hotels and is what we've talked about before is that this program doesn't have the wraparound services that assist people in making that next step in their lives, connecting them to permanent housing, connecting them to jobs, connecting them to services. And so we could extend the inevitable, robbing from the future where we were building affordable housing units or we could look at how we're going to address this um, going forward. And we recognize that it's going to be a, a challenging transition for some, but we believe that it really is the right time um, in the summer to begin to move back to the position of where we were before the pandemic, which is really a shelter first state where we work to house and, and support individuals with a, with a GA program that really provides backup in emergent situations. And why is summer a good time for that transition to happen? We know that there are a group of folks who will self-resolve um, and for many of them, it's a much easier option in the summer um, than in the winter. We recognize that in the winter, um, we have, we have uh, and will continue to have programs that assist people um, during adverse weather conditions. And so now is the time. We could keep extending this um, and extending it forward, but that's only putting a pause on folks' lives and the ability to look at what the next step is um, rather than helping them, um, helping them make that next step. What does self-resolve mean? There are some of the individuals who we've talked to in the hotels um, who have alternative plans. Um, and they're waiting for the program to end until they initiate those. Those could be going back to living with friends and family, and we've got programs that have been implemented across the state to help support um, those transitions. Um, it could mean, um, you know, being able to find a unit with a voucher that, that, that they currently have. Um, there are a myriad of different mechanisms. Sometimes it's going back to where um, they've lived before and that may or may not be in the state of Vermont. So there are a proportion of folks who have told us that they have that, they have that next step planned out and they're waiting for the program to end to make that happen. Mm -hmm. We recognize that one, and, and folks have acknowledged that one of the limitations that we have in the state of Vermont is a units issue. Affordable housing is a challenge. It's why they've made investments in VHCB and others, um, and maybe we need to look at more flexibly deploying those funds to invest in our future and putting in place affordable housing units. We also recognize that the federal government does have some limitations on, and we're look, looking at and evaluating that on the way that the, that the vouchers are delivered and that may engage in a conversation about, about those federal programs. Um, and again, it really is a, that you're right, there is a units issue where, um, and we're really trying to look at making that investment in the future. Um, and we know that, that, that we are things that we need to do now to help make that transition. But afford the investments in affordable housing that this administration has done have been unprecedented, and we're and we're continuing to move forward in that long-term game. In this situation where we have so few units <coughs> online, I think we all know that landlords have a lot of leeway in who they can pick and choose to occupy their units that they do have available mm -hmm. when they come online. Do you think that there is some role that the state government may have in compelling landlords to house people with Section Eight vouchers? Yeah. 
I would want to think about that more carefully. Um, I do know that there are programs like the Landlord Assistance Program that already are in place in the state of Vermont. Um, incentive programs like in the VHIP program that help to help folks to really look at um, who they choose to support and how they choose to support them. So we already have a group of, of supports for landlords and property owners to serve this population. I think that we will continue to evaluate what additional supports may be necessary. I, I could just expand just a little bit more on that. And I didn't finish uh, what I was saying about VACB. If we took the $50 million, you're making the point. Uh, because we took the $50 million away from BACB for permanent housing and put it towards this, this emergency program. Um, in two and a half months, it's gone. And then we don't have the units in September. So we have to find the balance here. And again, I, it's, it's difficult. Um, and um, none of us want to be in this position. Uh, but it's the position we're in, and we have to face it. Um, the VHIP program in particular, and I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Hanford to come up and talk about that uh, a bit, because that uh, program that we put in place um, earlier uh, is something we've been advocating for for a while, and it's, it's, it's been the quickest um, turnaround time of any program I think we've, uh, we've encountered. Um, so, Commissioner Hanford, could you just come up and, and just talk about VHIP? and the number of people, the number of units we put online in what period of time, that would be helpful for them to get that context. Sure, thanks, Governor. So the Vermont Housing Improvement Program, uh, to date, we have about 530 units online from that program, with about 70% of those serving folks exiting homelessness. Um, and we can bring these units on average within six months and under $35,000 per unit. Um, one of the areas that we're trying to expand that program this session in S100 is to allow more flexibility in that program. Um, and referencing the cases that have been talked about in the motel and hotel, there's a few cases in there where folks actually had an apartment, but they were condemned because it was unsafe. You know, why are we talking about that? VHIP, we've been asking for VHIP to be used in those situations for several years. We could prevent people from being displaced from unsafe housing if we can go in and fix those units before people end up in a hotel motel. So that is a fix that currently is in S100. And bringing it back to S100, for years we've been talking about regulatory reforms so that we can get housing built faster, quicker, more parts of the state. Um, and you know, with the, the gravity of the housing situation right now, you know, I, I share the governor's you know, concerns that the bill is good, but it could be great. We could be doing more. And um, we've been talking about these reforms knowing that we've needed these units for years now. So um, this isn't a surprise that we have a, a shortage of units uh, compared to the need. It's been growing year after year. Um, I'm hopeful that S100 um, continues to improve and we can, we can get some real reforms going. Governor, as you may have heard, there's a, uh, a controversy that's uh, brewing in the Essex Westford School District. Um, one, at least one school is using person first language when it comes to reproductive health. This was a suggestion that was put forth by a working group that included um, the Agency of Education and the Department of Health. Um, it's caused, uh, it, it, it is ruffling some feathers. Have, have, have you seen or, or talked with any of the folks within those two agencies about how this is shared out? I have not, and uh, I have been watching the, the controversy. Um, it, to me, it seems like we went a little too far uh, in this, but at the same time, at the end of the day, um, I don't know who it's really hurting, uh, but, um, but it seems as though there might be some room in between. I mean, if, for, for sex education uh, in, in those age groups, fifth and sixth graders, it seems like we could be talking uh, about boys, girls, and um, those who are born into different bodies and, and, and trans uh, rights and, and things of that nature. We could build that in. It seems like we could have it both ways. Uh, but, but again, this is a local uh, decision, a local decision by uh, the Westford Essex uh, School District, and uh, that's the way our system works. Uh, the House's fourth bedroom bill is supposed to get prelim approval from 
from the Senate today. I was just wondering if you kind of shared a similar stance when we last talked about this a couple months ago. What, what was it again? I'm sorry. House's sports betting bill. Oh, yeah. It's supposed to get prelim approval from the Senate today. Just wondering if your stance is still the same on that. As yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's something that we've been uh, promoting for quite a number of years and look forward to uh, getting the finish line. Um, back to child care. Uh, I know you're not happy with the level of spending in the Senate bill, but you, you like the construct, right? It's, it's, the, same it's the same construct as ours, right? Um, leaving aside the question of, of funding in the House bill, I gather you have a, a issue with the policy direction that they want to go in. And I, I wonder if you can just sort of like isolate for us. The yeah, concern. I, I actually don't know what exactly the House position was uh, with the child care uh, bill. Uh, I just know what the Senate proposal was, and that it was it almost mirrored what our proposal was. Um, so I gravitated towards that, but I don't know what the what the difference was with the House. So they want to require public school districts to provide full full time. Oh yeah, pre K. Right. Um, right. I mean, they seem it's, it's right. like an intuitive thing to yeah. them to have them play a role in this and. Do you have concerns with that? Yeah, I, the only the concerns I had when, when I first heard about that was what do we do with the kids in the summer, right? Um, so we were able to deal with them uh, through the school year, but then what happens in the summer? That was my initial reaction. I still, still believe that there's some merit uh, to this and that we should take a look at it, but it may not be uh, this year. It may be something they can consider in the future, but it seems as though it's uh, it's got some... Um, some legs, and we should uh, we should talk about it further. Governor, indeed, for Secretary Sanderson as well. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield is uh, going to be partnering or uh, affiliating with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Um, how do you see this uh, fundamentally affecting Vermonters? Healthcare and how we interact with our healthcare system. I don't believe it will affect us immediately. Uh, I do worry about what this means in the future. I think. Uh, I think uh, the other states' um, structure is, is larger than ours, and uh, we are just a uh, minority partner at that point. So I'm a little concerned about the future in that regard, uh, but immediately uh, over the next uh, year, two years, probably won't f see or feel any, any difference. Either one of you want to weigh in on that? Did you? Yeah, I'll just echo that. I'll say that... Uh, I think there's opportunity sometimes with affiliations to uh, gain scale, to uh, make entities uh, more sustainable long term. So I think there's some economies of scale that could be had with affiliations. So I'll just leave it there since um, our, you know, the filing will be coming to our department shortly to review the Form A filing. And with, you know, th this of course follows news that Blue Cross Blue Shield and it's separate but related that they will not be participating in the ACO next year, I believe. Um, with One Care's budget in front of the Green Mountain Care Board right now, I'm just curious as to, you know, what, what the administration will be looking for in terms of the performance and um, uh, of, of, of whether Vermonters, whether we know it's working, I guess, is, you know, what, what will you be looking for? Secretary Samuelson. So I'm going to go back to your first question first, and then I'll then I'll move forward to your second. Um, related to the Blue Cross Blue Shield merger, I think I echo the governor and Commissioner Gaffney's um, points. I do think uh, one of the things that we will be looking at in the future is uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield's continued commitment, and they've assured us that they are committed to trans continuing to transform the way that we're providing health care in Vermont. There is an opportunity with, I'm optimistic, there's an opportunity with Michigan to bring analytic tools and other tools that we can't afford to scale here in Vermont. But again, the details will come in, in future years of whether they join us in the, in the reforms. So I think as they make this transition um, to Michigan, it's not surprising um, that they are it's taking another year to evaluate their participation in the current all-payer model. I wish that they would reconsider that. But I think it's also important for us to, to acknowledge that right now, um, working in collaboration with healthcare providers, with the Green Mountain Care Board, with the Agency of Human Services, we are really looking towards the future model, which is going, which our current model ends in 2020 
um, at the end of 2024. So in 2025, really, what is it that we are looking for and defining that for health care reform going forward? So it's my hope that if Blue Cross Blue Shield takes a year off for this coming year, um, that they will continue to engage in our in-state conversations related to the direction that we're going to go and that they will join us in 2025. In 2025, could that be something other than, than all pay, or I guess what would that be? Our goal would be, and, and it laid out by multiple insur by the insurers in the state, that it still will be a multi-payer um, model um, that will gain some operational efficiencies um, across the payers, um, and that will continue on our journey to improve the, both the quality and the affordability of health care in Vermont. Um, you talked about no concerns in the short term for this merger or affiliation. Um, will there be a, a, a way through whatever regulatory review you're going to be doing in advance of signing off on to, to determine what the downside risk may be and, and the extent to which those risks might be realized? Yeah, there's certainly a process when we receive the, uh, and it is, a, it is an affiliation. Um, so when we receive that, we'll, we'll be reviewing both all the financials, we're reviewing the governance, we're reviewing uh, a number of areas. So um, I think all that is under consideration and part of our review process will contemplate that in that, in that process. There's actually a, a hearing process that's uh, also part of that mechanism. I want to go to the phones quickly and then I can come back to the room. Um, Christopher Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good morning. No questions this afternoon. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Mag. Hi, Tim and I are calling back to Pete's uh, question about child care. As you well know, um, um, development specialists and businesses put child care right up there with workforce and housing as, as the biggest impediment to economic development. Is there, um, and in light of, it looks like the, the, the family leave part of what the legislation is going through is, is not going to be as big an issue on the, the tax and fee side and uh, the urgency that there seems to be with the child care, which of course goes back before the pandemic as these other issues do. Do you uh, have a sense of urgency to get something done on the child care side now? Well, Tim, uh, let's go back down memory lane just a little bit. When I first came into office, um, this was a priority for me. Uh, not so much for the legislature. We put together a number of proposals for the legislature to consider. Um, they seemed like um, reasonable uh, attempts uh, to increase uh, the level of child care opportunities. Uh, we, and it was in millions of dollars, not hundreds of millions of dollars, but millions of dollars. And um, that was turned down. In fact, uh, when the Wayfair decision came along, we, we said we ought to take that money uh, that we're receiving, this newfound money, and put that towards child care. Um, that was uh, um, resisted uh, uh, in the legislature as well. Um, we've been continuing to uh, try to uh, move forward uh, with child care uh, for six years. And, um, and I've said uh, that it's important to me. I think we should do it in a measured way. Um, we went again from uh, we've, we've doubled uh, or tripled uh, the amount of, uh, of money we're putting into child care since I came into office. Uh, and uh, and we've, we've had to um, put that on the forefront and, and, and fight for that uh, every time that we, uh, we move forward. So um, in this instance, uh, when we're talking about, again, millions of dollars uh, instead of hundreds of millions of dollars, we put together a proposal this year uh, that lives within our means for $56 million that would take care of an additional 4,000 kids. So this isn't just $56 million for child care. This is $56 million additional dollars on top of what we already do. Um, so that's a, a huge, huge step forward. Uh, and it would put us, even at that, uh, I believe, uh, again, I haven't uh, researched this, but I would have to believe that would put us in the top five, top ten states uh, in terms of, uh, of child care. So um, it doesn't mean we stop there. It just means that as we try to build and, and, 
and do this in a, a, a way, a fashion uh, that protects everyone. Because I know as a business owner myself, a former business owner myself, taxes uh, were, were an impediment uh, for me and, and, and certainly something that, uh, that I was concerned with and sensitive to. So I would say, Tim, if you um, maybe poll some of your members, uh, I remember uh, them being in favor of more uh, child care when, uh, when it was, I believe, the employees that were going to be paying most of that. Um, but um, but if it's a if it's a cost to doing business, I don't know what their uh, reaction is uh, to this. Now again, we all campaigned on this over the last uh, the last cycle, uh, and I don't remember anyone campaigning on the on the provision that it was going to cost 117 million dollars in payroll taxes to implement. So we've done it without increasing uh, taxes and fees and. And I just think there's some merit to living within our means and, and then increasing that incrementally uh, in the next few years. Well, I was just wondering, given the, you know, the, now we have inflation on top of the, um, and supply chain on top of the housing and workforce issues, if this has become even more urgent as far as the, the economy and what seemingly is a more fragile economy right now. Well, again, 56 million is not anything to sneeze at, and uh, that's a huge investment in any other time. Um, again, I look back when we were proposing six, seven million dollars, uh, and with the Wayfair decision, I think that's what it would have started out uh, being, and then it would have gone to maybe 20 or 30 million, 40 million. I don't know what it is uh, today. Uh, but that would have uh, put us in a better position today if we had moved forward with that. So $56 million is nothing to sneeze at. And, uh, and I believe, again, uh, that this is something that meets, meets our goals, meets uh, in a measured way on, uh, on how we have this balance uh, between affordability in this state and uh, trying to attract more people here as well. So. It depends on who this impacts. Uh, again, uh, a payroll tax, uh, everyone pays, uh, even those with low incomes, uh, those with high incomes, everyone pays something. So again, uh, I think our approach uh, was, was, um, was strategic. Uh, I think, uh, again, we, could, we, we built a budget uh, that actually grew. The base budget grew by 8%. Um, the, the, budget that came out of the, the Senate, I believe, is 13 percent uh, growing the base. And that doesn't include any of those additional fees and, and, uh, and taxes. So again, I'm worried about the downturn. I'm worried about the future. And, uh, and I'm trying to, to make sure uh, that we don't put ourselves in a position, a perilous position, uh, where there's a downturn and we have to start laying people off and taking um, very, very, uh, I, I guess, uh, consequential, make consequential decisions on, uh, on where we find the money. So again, I'm just trying to, to be practical about this and measure it. Thank you. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. We can hear you typing. Jason, can you hear me on the right? We can. Uh, Governor, I, maybe some of this uh, goes to Commissioner Hansford, but I'm curious, uh, the S-100 bill came out of the Senate with some wins for the proponents of that bill, but also some losses, it appears. Um, in yours and Commissioner Hansford's uh, uh, view, is it, addressing what Commissioner Hansford, Hansford said before, what would strengthen it even more if that those things were uh, brought into this bill? Well, as they came out of uh, economic development, they would have uh, helped tremendously in terms of Act 250 uh, changes. Uh, uh, changes. We're getting a little feedback, Tom. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Um, it, was, it was more the Act 250 uh, regulatory changes that uh, both the League of Cities and Towns and, uh, and my administration, myself included, obviously, um, wanted to see move forward. Uh, and that were, 
they were uh, watered down uh, to practically nothing uh, when it went through Senate Natural Resources. So again, uh, they've made some improvements uh, in the House. And uh, do you want to speak on that, Commissioner? Thank you. Maybe they'll believe you. I think the governor summarized it. Um, the bill that left uh, Senate Economic Development had broader Act 250 reform, which we've been calling for for years. Um, it was narrowed uh, um, in the Senate Natural Resources. Um, good news is, is Senate uh, House and Environment, they didn't further narrow those Act 250 reforms. Um, there was, in fact, a very small increase, which we appreciate. But uh, as the governor said, we, we really feel the the gravity of the housing crisis in the moment that we are in, uh, there should be more Act 250 reforms to encourage more housing development. One major piece of that, Commissioner, was, <coughs> if I did correctly, is the uh, now developed into 25 units versus uh, 10 units uh, and not have to go through the Act 250 process. Is that accurate? That is accurate, uh, but only in designated areas. So, you know, one of our um, concerns is all those designated areas statewide only uh, amount to 0.3 percent of Vermont's land area um, and so it's great that the Act 250 was increased in those areas to 25 units within five years within five miles before triggering Act 250 but um, that, that's leaving 99.7 percent of Vermont out of um, th this housing solution. So basically you have to be a designated downtown or a designated uh, correct. There, there's five designated areas, um, designated downtown, designated village, uh, designated um, neighborhood development area, new town center, or growth center. And all those areas combined uh, represent 0.3% of Vermont's land area. And finally, my understanding from the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, one reversion was going from 10 people needed to oppose a permit that's back to one. Is that correct? Uh, that was one of the, the issues that was identified um, as the bill was um, leaving House Environment and Energy. Um, there appears to be an agreement on a fix right now um, that, that, that we've reached, at moving that back to 10 and further restricting that folks cannot appeal um, housing projects on the basis of the character of the area. So that would be improving what we have now and fixing that, that mistake. Um, I, I'm never confident uh, of, 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 of anything to do with, with housing, unfortunately. Um, I'm hopeful. Fair answer. Thank you very much. No other questions. Thanks. Any others in the room? Um, Governor, Commissioner Bolio told Ways and Means today that the state and local tax share would be 14.57, third highest in the U.S., if all the legislature's big spending proposals go through. Um, if they do, will you veto that budget? Again, um, as I reported earlier, uh, we're going to see things in the aggregate. Um, I'm concerned about the future of Vermont and making sure that we're affordable and that we live within our means. And uh, so we'll look and see what they come up with. Um, we have our tax commissioner and, and many others uh, throughout the administration going before the committees to make this very point. And uh, again, I'm, I'm concerned uh, about where we're going. and and what's on the horizon. There, there are storm clouds on the horizon. We're seeing on a national level. And even the, uh, the legislature's uh, economists, our economists, has said there's going to be a downturn at some point. And when that hits, um, there's going to have to be decisions to be made on how to, uh, how to make sure that we're, we're able to, uh, to continue to provide the services uh, that are essential. So again, that's why I keep saying we have to make the most of this moment. We have to use every bit of uh, federal uh, money that we received, and we have to match it. And we have to make sure that we, we have it available to us uh, when we do hit this downturn so we can keep this economy going. And the antidote, I mean, again, uh, Sarah, I, just to go back to, to housing and emergency housing, the antidote to emergency housing is permanent housing. And if this is truly a crisis, if this is a housing crisis that we face, we have to take extraordinary measures. And I wouldn't call having, you know, some of the regulatory changes we're asking for as extraordinary. They're common sense. 
And if we're not willing to do that, then maybe, maybe we don't have a crisis on our hands. But, but if we do, then we better take some steps to rectify that. What about rent control? I'm sorry? You need rent control? I don't think that's the answer. I think volume's the answer. You know, I mean, it's supply and demand. And, the, and, and I guarantee, once we put more units on the ground in place, then you'll see the rents subside uh, because there'll be more uh, supply than there is demand. So glad you brought up housing again. Um, I have more questions for the Secretary. Um, you talked about housing and ending the program in the summertime, hopefully avoiding adverse weather events. Vermont is increasingly seeing extreme heat waves. Is the state doing anything to prepare for expanded capacity at cooling shelters, water can outs, things like that? I don't think that that's direct. I don't think that that's directly related to housing. I think what you have seen over the last couple of years is the Department of Health and others really working on ensuring that Vermonters are safe during those high heat events. And I think that that will continue. How is it not related to housing? I think what you see is that the, the, that's regardless of whether someone is housed or unhoused, it is, it can t it's an issue for, most, for Vermonters who are experiencing the stress of that. And I think the Department of Health and others ad address that currently through their cooling shelters and others, and we'll continue, we'll continue to do that work. Do you see a need for expanding that capacity then? I think we'll have to, again, we don't know what we have fully in front of us as we make this transition. I think we will evaluate the operating environment as it emerges um, and, re and respond appropriately. Um, and then also uh, in your comments, you refer to some people who are currently housed in motels going back to the living situation where they lived before. We know that a not insignificant number of people who are um, experiencing homelessness are people who flee domestic violence, particularly women. Is the state planning on doing anything to guarantee that they won't go back to a dangerous situation? So I think that you see in some of the investments that have been made in, in housing um, that we are continuing to strengthen the program to support individuals who um, have domestic violence, and that's inherent in the, in the GA program as it already exists. What do those programs look like? Let me get back to you on that in, in more detail because I think what you want is a, a much more in-depth view than I think we have time for today, but I can, I can get you both those numbers and what those investments look like offline. Okay. And then, Governor, the feds are um, winding down the federal COVID emergency declaration in about a week now. Can you give us an idea of what that transition will look like for Vermont, particularly with um, guarantees of free testing and vaccine? I believe um, the testing would still be uh, supplied by insurance companies at this point in time. I don't know if you have the answer to that or not, but we put that into place before. We did, but we did end the, uh, we did issue a bulletin, the Department of Financial Regulation issued a bulletin in uh, end of March um, that the uh, uh, emergency uh, has expired, that we uh, issued a rule that should it reemerge, we can reactivate it. But at this point, the uh, cost-free uh, COVID um, tests and the like will expire with the emergency. We got one more minute. Uh, you signed up on the, the end of life law reform. Uh, just a good comment on why you think it's a good idea going forward and your thought process. Well, again, it, it was just a border issue from my standpoint, and I didn't think that, that the border uh, should determine whether you uh, engage in, in uh, this program or not. Thank you very much.